Hi everybody, welcome on in. Welcome on in. Not me hearing my own voice, I hate that. Hi, welcome in. I'm a professional streamer, I swear, I know how to do this. But hi, uh, I'm gonna talk about myself last because I'm joined by two amazing humans, two good friends. Uh, but Brian, since we connived you slash asked you nicely to join us, would you uh, tell people who you are, what you do, and uh, what you're gonna do with us today? Um, well, I can answer the last one first. I don't know. No. Uh, I am Brian, I'm Urban Bohemian, I am a variety streamer, uh, gamer, foodie, music lover, uh, TTRPG player, etc. And I am here uh, with Painting Pirate and Cypher of Tear to talk about, <clears throat> pardon me, uh, local legend. Jeez. There's a command for this, I hope, because yeah, I, I clearly not had enough sleep since my stream this morning. Uh, but I'm here to help y'all showcase this lovely Kickstarter. Uh, it seems like it's a really fun setting. Epic Encounters, Epic Legends. I was like, Epic Legends? Local Legends? No, I'm a local legend, but this is not. This is Epic Legends. I'm not a local legend. Please don't quote me on that. Somebody else go. <laughs> pirate, who are you? I, I, will, I will happily jump in. Hi, I am the painting pirate, he, him pronouns, a variety streamer, mini painter slash Final Fantasy aficionado. Uh, definitely did not start this stream out by immediately knocking my audio equipment off my desk as we were starting, so that's a great start. Um, I thoroughly disagree. Urb is, in fact, a local legend. And yes, the, the thing we are promoting, it is Epic Encounters, Local Legends is the full title of the thing that we are we are doing today. And yes, I will be uh, sh helping showcase. We're going to do a little bit of mini painting later on, which is definitely my particular area of expertise. I am very, very, very excited to be doing this with such wonderful, wonderful people. I've been a big fan of Steam Forge stuff for a while, and I'm very much looking forward to getting to do this and show it off to all of you lovely people. Uh, yes, Melissa's correct. There is a legendary herb on the field. <laughs> <laughs> I I don't know about agreeing with those stats, but I don't I don't have any bonuses, no field bonuses. Sorry. Aw, boo. Uh, and I'm Tanya aside from Tear. I uh, I asked Pirate to join me, and we're gonna first play a game that he is going to DM Brian and I through. But before we do that, uh, in case you hadn't seen it, the Kickstarter is fully funded. Uh, I backed it myself this morning. But there's stretch goals. There's still a few days left. It goes until July 8th. So if you like minis, if you like games, you should go check it out. If you do exclamation legends, it will give you a link to the Kickstarter with a link that will show Steamforge how many people came through because of the stream. And that can help us get more opportunities like this in the future. Uh, that we're going to eventually get Brian in to, to do minis with us. Maybe, sort of. Maybe. I boomst. Moi. Minis, miniature, miniature crafts. I don't know. We, oui, oui. I, I painted something once and it wasn't awful. Okay, I gave it a purple manicure, so you know it's fine. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right. If you want to kick us off, pirate, with some talking points, or just jumping into the game, while I uh, do a little thing behind the scenes and get your subtitles into the stream because guess who fails at accessibility uh, <clears throat> well i will happily happily kick us off so yeah to touch on a few of those talking points let's talk a little bit briefly about what this set actually is because it is of course full of wonderful wonderful miniatures which we will be showing off showing off later but there's more to it than that uh, so this the whole point of the the epic encounter set that steamforged have that they have set out is a series of encounters that are designed to be able to be dropped into any ongoing campaign or run as a one shot. And given that my own DMing strategy is very much steal as much as possible, I love this type of stuff. <laughs> I find that very much easier. I, my approach to DMing is like playing with Lego bricks when I was a kid. Just grab a bunch of stuff from a different set and pile it into something that looks vaguely like it's meant to be something. Hi. That's how I DM. So this type of set is really super helpful for that. And the idea of the Epic Encounters local legends is that it's a set of taverns that you can specifically pop into these 
and gives you a bunch of NPCs, a bunch of smaller encounters that you can go through, as well as a big set piece encounter, which is where the miniatures really come in. Uh, what they've also done is given a bunch of fun little tavern games that you can use to kind of really set the scene in these types of areas. And for a tavern stuff specifically, for me as a DM, I am currently running a group through, we did Waterdeep Dragon Heist, now into Dungeons and the Mad Mage, which as the rivals of Waterdeep are well aware, features Trollskull Manor fairly prominently. So having to suddenly give my players a tavern to run was definitely something that I hadn't really expected to do. So stuff like this is super helpful for that, because, you know, where do all adventures start? In a tavern. It's a cliche for a reason. It's easy. So this is that type of thing that especially I think it's really good for newer DMs who are worried about the concept of having to do a room full of NPCs all at once. It gives you that kind of leverage in. And for more experienced DMs, cool. There's the stuff to build on. Take the stuff you like, throw out the stuff you don't. Fantastic. Uh, I kind of like that. Yeah, one of the things I especially really like about uh, this set, and the, we're going to kind of go into this in a minute, is I have a Fantasia, which for those who are unaware of it, is that thing where you can't make images in your brain, which is a constant struggle for me as a DM. So I really like things that have super detailed descriptions available to me or lots of artwork that I can have in front of me to describe because I can't summon up the image in my head to describe to my players. So this type of thing is super, super helpful. That kind of image resource or big detailed descriptions, which you have there if you want, super, super helpful for me. Like those, those little like side boxes that a lot of modules have, like here's a little extra descriptive bit. Those are my lifeblood. I love those. Writers, please throw as many of those in as possible. They really help me. So, <laughs> um, so that's kind of what we're going to start with, because we're going to go through and give the description of one of the taverns in, in the module, which is going to be the Nodding Dragon, which is an amazing tavern name. Uh, we'll give kind of the set piece, and then we will pivot in and just get this kind of, get the, the mini game going to show you the kind of thing. And again, the, there is a lot of mini games in this module. We've been given one of them to showcase. Um, other people who are doing similar promotion stuff have others. So there's a whole bunch of the, I think there's, I forget what the actual count is, but there was an impressive amount of them. They have fun little cards that go with them and all of them are easy to play and pick up. So I think that's enough of kind of a preamble. So, uh, <laughs> I'm happy to babble on if needs be, but if we're if we're good with the captioning, I can throw us in if we are all ready. Yes, yes, we now have caption. Oh, fantastic! I I really like this because, as as Pirate said, it is a sort of cliche and a trope that okay, you all you all meet in a tavern, and a lot of the adventures and source books and things even that you come up with don't say what that tavern looks like. You know, they may if it's a specific adventure. They may say, oh, who are people in there and what's going on? But it's really all for you to come up with out of your head. And yes, as as I have recently, like, <laughs> just my DM'd for my first time, sometimes coming up with that stuff is really hard on the fly. Otherwise, yeah, I also have problem making pictures. So I just basically grab stuff from movies and TV shows that I've seen and throw that in. You know, let's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. So then let's jump in. I will go through the, the wonderful description that they have given us to set the scene for our two adventurers as they approach the Nodding Dragon. Externally, the Nodding Dragon is a large and imposing structure situated along a populous main road. It is in fact one of the main trade routes across the continent, ensuring a constant flow of new customers. When the sun falls in the afternoon, the peak of the roof casts a looming shadow over the surrounding area and creates a halo-like glow as sunlight bounces off the beaten brass fixtures around the upper floor windows. Everyone in the surrounding areas knows of the Nodding Dragon, and despite there being numerous potential places to get a nice, frothy ale alongside the road, the Nodding Dragon is considered worth travelling that little bit further. The tavern holds almost two dozen tables, some of which are long enough to seat ten or more regulars. From sunup to sundown, these tables are full of locals, each with a large pewter tankard in hand, foaming over whatever ale is currently on tap. Food is served all day from a large cauldron over the fire, the chef's own recipe stew, packed full of local vegetables and game or huge haunches of roasted ox. 
that passes through mingle with those who dwell on the farms or live in nearby woods and fens, bonded by a shared love of good ale. The large square tavern is adorned with all manner of local heraldry, exposed wood beams, and a large, welcoming open hearth. The Nodding Dragon is both vibrant and successful, not through just through the quality of the ale or the food it serves, but through the sheer volume of patrons it serves every day. Every traveller stops at the Nodding Dragon. Merchant caravans, wizards on the hunt for arcane knowledge, burly barbarians with a toast for ale and roasted meat. The Nodding Dragon is known to all. Though all taverns have issues with brawling and rough clientele, the Nodding Dragon keeps those sort of issues to a minimum due to the tavern's innkeeping duo, Porthos and Agatha Gimes. Porthos, a former soldier, is quick to step in and shut down any trouble. Agatha, his wife, and the tavern's cook, is quicker still to prod Porthos from behind the bar the moment any trouble flares up. This constant feeling of calm is a big part of what makes the Nodding Dragon such a well-loved and welcoming place to visit. The Nodding Dragon is a tavern that never sleeps. Porthos' famous late-night lock-ins mean that those staying the night can generally find company in the tavern, all times of the night. If someone's looking for rest, though, hospitality is a passion of Agatha's, and no request is too much trouble, as any overnight guest can attest. The tavern has two upper floors which offer both private and shared accommodation, usually including a warm bath and a hot meal served at the bar. Welcome to the Nodding Dragon. So as our two erstwhile adventurers, weary from the road, enter this wonderfully welcoming tavern, they're greeted by an individual seated with an easy view of the entrance, an advanced in age, yet still physically in good form, elven gentleman, hairline visibly receding, but still thick and well cared for, silver mane, flows down, settling over his vibrant, uh, half-opened pink overshirt as he lounges at a, a table with a set of small objects in front of him. And he calls out as our adventurers enter the, ca- the tavern. Says, ah, now you look like fresh blood. Welcome, welcome to the Nodding Dragon. Come, come, come take a seat. Allow me to hope you've rested a little bit and let me show you a, uh, a little bit of a local game we like to play around here. He gestures to two, te- two chairs that are on opposite ends of the table he, seats at, he sits at the head of. Well, this seems friendly and slightly, only slightly untrustworthy. Only slightly? He just called us fresh blood. I mean, it is our first time here. Maybe that's a local custom. Mm. We'll talk about this later. So he gestures to to the seat, assuming you you sit down, and says, welcome, welcome, welcome. Now, my name is Donovan Gaidau. Pleasure to meet you both. A little bit of a a greeter around these places. Not not, not particularly a regular, but I like to ply my trade every here and there, and always a pleasure to meet new people, new faces. Now, this particular game I'm going to teach you is one one well-known and well-suited to settle the argument of who's going to pay. It can also be utilized in more of a tournament structure, should you so wish. Easy to, pl- easy to play, but there's a certain little element of trickery that can potentially be involved. Now, you don't need a lot to play this. The game is called Smoke and Mirrors. And as he says this, he casts a prestidigitation spell as a little poof of smoke appears out of his hand for a little dramatic embellishment. <laughs> he cracks open one of the small containers sitting on the table in front of him. It says, now, all you need is a set of these little fancy dice. Most people seem to carry them around for some bizarre reason. I'm not sure why, but all travelers seem to have several sets of these little magical math rocks around. I'm really not sure what purpose they have, but everyone has them, so it's convenient for games such as these. For this, you're going to need three of them. The four-sided one, a six-sided one, and lastly, an eight-sided one. Which is awful. That eight-sided one doesn't get an awful lot of use, so it's nice to have a little game like this that gives you some reason to pull that one out every once in a while. Now, 
The game is simple. It's a game of misdirection towards each of you, each of your opponents. What you will be doing is you will take one of those three dice secretly into your hand and hold it out towards your opponent. On the count of three, you will both reveal your dice. Now, this game is going to be played across several rounds. One of you will take on the role of the attacker. The other, the defender. The rules work as such. If both of you have just selected the same dice, let's say the four-sided one, the attacker gains a point. If you've selected different dice, the defender gains a point. Now, you may note at this point, the odds are significantly stacked in the favor of the defender, which is why after the initial round, the roles are switched. This happens vice versa until one player scores their third point and is declared the winner. So, let's see which of you is going to buy the first round, eh? If you are prepared, both of you select your first dice and which of you wants to take on the role of the attacker. Oh, I will. Somehow, I had a feeling. Wow. All right. Okay. So, select and secrete your dice in your fist. On the count of three, reveal your dice. A one, a two, three, reveal. We have an eight-sided dice and... <laughs> I'm sorry, my eyesight's a little gone in my, in my advanced age. What is the, the dice you're holding there? Both, we both pulled a D8. You both have the oh. eight. Excellent. Well, in that case, the attacker gains your first point. Huzzah. We are up at one nil. So the roles are now switched. You, my friend, are now the attacker. And our victorious attacker now finds themselves on the defensive. So let's try this again. Select your next dice. Interesting. You can, of course, select the same dice repeatedly, should you so wish. Hmm. Hmm. And you use this to and you use this to bicker over the tab. Interesting. Well, many reasons to potentially use it. That tends to be the most frequent one. Alright, if you both have your dice selected. Mm -hmm. One. A two. Three reveal your dice. We have a six and my poor eyesight is so <laughs> I, I, I both Six-sided dice. We once again have the same dice selected. Twice in a row, most rare of a result. Hmm. But we once again have a point to our attacker. We are now tied. One all. The rolls once again reverse. Our initial attacker now finds themselves once again in that role. So then... Math rocks for math. Oh. Ah. Uh. Oh, don't worry. Frequently, we find that this does wind up with people chucking the math rocks at each other as the game reaches a height. That's, that's one of the reasons we chose to utilize the four-sided one. They do the most damage when thrown. Now, mm. select your next dice. And a one, a two, a three, reveal the dice. And we have an eight sided dice selected, and I uh, believe if my eyesight does not deceive me, that is a four sided dice. So we have a point to our defender this time, since we now have a difference. Two to one. With a, a roll switching and our defender having advantage. Will we hmm. tie, or will this be match point to our new attacker? So hmm. this is. Hmm. I mean, it feels as though in the beginning we were sort of thinking along similar measures. I did not actually guess what you were going to pick the last time, but we may end up uh, die to die again. Yeah, I figured you would try one of each. It's such a fascinating game. Intriguing you know, when played between friends or between strangers. You learn a lot about each other's way of thinking of this one. Quite intriguing. Now, for what may well be our final round, Select your dice, my friends. I see an intense level of focus. I love it, yes. 
the strategizing has commenced very well. Here we go. One, two, three. Reveal the dice. Ooh, we have a six-sided and... Oh, oh, I, what? oh, I believe that is an eight. It that is. then would be a point to our now victorious defender. Mm. Congratulations, a 3-1 That's... victory. That is now out of character. I kind of like how simple that is, and yet you kind of have to, you do have to keep track of a little bit. Like, when the roles switch, you have to remember, wait, am I trying to match? No, I'm trying not to match. But, mm -hmm. you know, it's it's a very much like, so I can clearly not choose the die in front of me kind of situation. Like, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. But it doesn't, at least in our case, we've known each other so long. IRL, it's like, hmm. And I know you're super competitive. I am not. <laughs> I also love with a game structured like this, you could very easily add some additional mechanics into it. Like, for example, if you wanted to maybe add like a sleight of hand check mm -hmm. you know, to, to somehow switch out the dice during the reveal, there could potentially be a few things you could you could add some stuff into there as well. So I, I love this type of thing for these types of tavern games. Incredibly simple, but you can immediately come with a lot of ways that this could be expanded on or you could do some interesting kind of screwy stuff with it so yeah i as something to, to sit inside and be like yeah here's something you can do because i also love when i love when settings and sources do games you know mm -hmm. like they don't necessarily they may or may not have an impact they may or may not have rewards or you curry you favor with anyone in the pub it's just like hey here's something to do while you would normally, you know, as opposed to just staring at each other in silence in this scene that I've created, you're actually going to engage in some games. And, you know, maybe depending on how much you've, depending on how much you've had to drink, it may impact your decision or it may, you know, I can see, like you said, giving a sleight of hand check. I could also see giving, you know, giving spellcasters like a quick check to be like, can you successfully basically convince someone that this is the other kind of die? Or if there's another judge, as opposed to the two of you, are you able to persuade them that what they see is not what they see? Like, that would be kind of fun in those moments. Because not that any character would ever cheat. Oh, so absolutely we... not. No. In a tavern game? No, no. Can you imagine the rivals playing this, though? I, I would love to see this. I would absolutely love it. <laughs> oh, I mean, it's basically all of, us all of us playing to win against Gosric because he will feel the worst about having to pick up the check. Oh, you're right. But see, Gosrick would try to write it off as a business expense, especially since he's got a lot of money. He would because it's actually a team building exercise. So he'd probably be able to write this off. <laughs> wow. I'm just like, look, there's there's always there's always a loophole. Um and yeah, it's 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 an interesting form of like it's a very simple like, hey, you either match or you don't match, and you do best best of Three, well, is it best of three? Yeah, until one gets three points. So yes, yeah, first of three points. Yeah, sorry, not best of three. First two, three. That's it. Wow. What I, I say I particularly love about this this one, and there's a bunch of th these different tavern games. Like this is the one that we're we're showcasing, but again, mm -hmm. there, there are a bunch of others. What I like they've done with the variety. There's, for example, another game in there which involves taking d20s and physically rolling them towards a target, and the winner is the person who gets closest. So oh, I like that. I what I like about this the the way they've done the set though is they've got kind of a mix of those games that because obviously for that one that only works if you're all physically at the same table, right? So I like that there's a variety of things that are a little more like fairground game type of of things like that versus things that you can easily do with a virtual table as well. So I like that they've they've clearly kind of thought that through. It's like, okay, here's some stuff that you can do with, that requires you to be a physical table, but there's plenty of options for for those who have a remote table need as well. Yeah, especially now, that's really important to be able to to be able to play essentially with you know, like this is just simple. Like, okay, both of you show the mm -hmm. dice that you selected to the camera. You know, there's no there's no fudging this one. It's what you've got or not got. But yeah, if you were setting up. You know, if you're somebody who does terrain and minis and you're setting up your whole thing there and you're at the table and it's like, okay, now you now both of you have to 
essentially play like you know d20 bocce towards a thing that's kind of cool <laughs> Ooh, i wonder if you could manipulate the rules to make it instead of four six eight ten eight ten twelve well, I mean, since the main thing of this is whether or not your die match or don't match, that's, I, I would, I mean, imagine that you could use any of them. Um, I'm guessing that, like, they just chose these because, well, you know, some of these don't get a lot of love. I was, yeah. so I was wondering about that. Uh, I suspect, <laughs> and I don't know if they actually put this level of thought into it, but I suspect they went with these three because they're all similarly sized. That's my thing too. Like if it, you know, it's, it's, I have large hands, so I would be able to palm any of them, but yeah, just seeing the way, like if you're looking at your player across the table, doing a thing, you can kind of see the way they're trying to grab a die and it might be a little bit different if they were trying to pick up a D20 versus a D6. Mm -hmm. But that's, but yeah, that's anyway. again, something I love about this is it is simple enough. You can easily expand upon it and build it. Like any, mm. any of these like little type, and again, these types of little types of world building things are stuff that I find incredibly useful. I've seen so many times at so many tables, the things that players have most frequently engaged in for me are like, they go to like a fair or some sort of event and just having the little sideshow attractions that they can actually play through, nothing engages players more than giving them those little inconsequential bits of world building that make it feel that little bit more real. Yeah. Especially if it's one that you have like, maybe like a crooked, like Carney, like running the show, and they can kind of see through it, get one over on them because we've, oh, yeah. all, we've all been deceived by those by those carnival games. So it can feel good to kind of get one over on someone, see through the trick. Yeah, and I think the last our last few, um, you know, when we've played on Rivals, our last few seasons have have involved pulling one of those bits of flavor. That's really all it is, out of the material that we're doing, or kind of inventing our own thing to say, okay. I know that there's an overarching story and y'all are going to get somewhere, but first, do you want to do this fun little thing? Just because let's see how our characters will deal with a silly game or a rhyming contest or something like that. Like, yeah, why not? Ooh. <laughs> Uh-oh, I heard those wheels from here. Uh, wow. <laughs> I'm just imagining, like, once we get out of whatever puzzle that Sharif is going to put us through... Have like a shawarma kind of moment at Troll Troll. <laughs> yes. And include the new girlfriend. Or not, she want, might be like. I just want a shawarma moment. Like, that'd be kind of awesome. Because like. I am very curious at the at the uh, at the end of our current season's adventures, um, what Salisa's plus one to the party is going to think of all this. Oh, like, boy. Which, what she's really <laughs> going to think about all this, you know? <laughs> I I totally want to steal a page out of B. Dave's book and do like an interstitial me or like do one of our post show things or maybe just like a one on one. But it'd be weird because I'd be both Selyse and Faye unless I'm strictly just Faye for that moment. Hmm. We'll have to think about adding that to our Patreon as some bonus content. That's a, that's a lot of bonus content because I have to do a lot of mental gymnastics to do it. Um, but yeah, I, I I like that they are. I don't know. Anytime you know, it's, it's one thing to say, "Hey, we have we have something that will go along," and you know, it's compatible with a lot of different TTRPGs, and you can use it to set the scene. You can use it to just basically email to your players and say, "Here's what the place you're about to go to into looks like," because maybe you're playing by email or you're playing by Discord. So I like the fact that they're basically giving you this way to flesh out what is the most simple element of every D&D &D campaign. You're like, oh yeah, it's a tavern. You've seen a tavern before, or have you? Like, so what, I didn't go, so I deliberately didn't use any of the NPCs that the book provides because I didn't want to get into spoiler territory. But one of the things they've done with this too that I really, really dig is it's a mechanic that they've, they've written in that I've actually never really seen a module do before, which is they've got, um, specific modifiers to difficulty checks based on actions the party can take. So, for example, in this particular tavern, the uh, Porthos, the, the innkeeper who runs it, he has a couple of modifiers you can do, which is if the party either buys a round of drinks or compliments the tavern, his difficulty check is lowered by two. 
So there's specific, like, this. these are the things that will work with this NPC. Because a lot of modules, like, it, and for the most part, this is fine. Like, the here is a couple of lines about this NPC. Go have fun. Do what you want with them. Right. That little bit of extra in, in, inspiration of here's some modifiers you can do, and here's specific things this NPC will, will go. And it then follows through to if they succeed, here is how his demeanor is going to change towards him if they fail he's not going to shut down completely. Like, here's a guidance for how he'll still interact with the party, but he's going to be a bit more weary. He's not going to be as open. So there's there's some specific guidances. So this type of this type of thing, I think, is fantastic, especially for newer DMs who maybe don't have as much experience with figuring those NPC interactions before that. That little bit of guidance, certainly for me, when I started DMing, that little bit of guidance <laughs> would have gone so far <laughs> towards removing the anxiety. Yeah, I uh, my first time. Um, I one one day I will share the document that uh, DM Jazzy hands uh, Eugenio Vargas and I worked on together, and most of it is me anxiously writing out every single kind of decision tree as to how encounters could go. Like, if they do this, this will happen. If they do this, this will happen. So having it already somewhere else that says, "Oh, here's modifiers based on what your party may or may not do," um, that. Well, that would that would help because yeah, it's like, okay, you know, you would normally think, yeah, if it's the owner of the bar and you say something nice about the bar, the owner is going to be more amenable to you, and it's nice to have that written down because you may also decide the other way. Like maybe the owner just thinks you're blowing smoke up their butt, and it's like, yeah, okay, everybody says that, whatever. But having that down there as an option for you to use or not. I think, you know, if you're more on the experienced end of the DM scale, you may look at this and say, this is really nice. This is really good. But as as always, it's down to what you running the story decide. They're just giving you a whole bunch of resource so that you can pluck from these things. Yeah. So what's funny is, I, I think I've told you this, Brian, that I have an NPC based on basically you in the Goose campaign. <laughs> That is a very dapper tiefling bartender. And I'm like, oh my god, I need to do this. Where somehow the rivals go to the bar that you manage it in Avernus. And now they have to do this game. And I want Virgil be- to meet the bartender and be like, what you? <laughs> I'm not meeting my. That's just I. That's that's a wait. I don't have this. I need to. I'll. I will double my camera for that day to do the Spider-Man meme to be like what what. Um, I like. I I kind of like the the fact and and you know when this is when this is fully fleshed out and released and everyone has access to not just the one that we play but all the games. I kind of love the fact that maybe you will decide to base the highest stakes imaginable outcome of your players on what boils down to a simple tavern game you know like oh okay yeah like okay first to three great go because that is that's like a 100 percent like you know a team band of mercs moment where they're basically doing rock paper scissors at like the last minute to decide who's going to go in like yeah sure we'll do yeah. something that easy to decide something this huge <laughs> So one thing too I will say about that, the entire set. So it's a whole bunch of taverns. Like we went through the extensive description of the Northern Dragon, but some of them are very much thematic. Like there's one in here, and the, the the tavern in particular that is the thing that even if we weren't like doing this, I would absolutely be back in this Kickstarter to get it myself anyway. Is there is one tavern that is essentially a hollowed out upturned pirate ship. <laughs> the artwork for it is amazing. It's literally just a ship on its end just <laughs> embedded into the ground and i need to know everything about this tavern i i want to do ev- i want to throw this thing into everything i run forever because that is an amazing concept i love that as a building idea i, I love wow. anytime someone turns an upturned boat or an upturned ship basically into a building i'm like yes please let's do this mm-hmm. that's lovely yeah and that's uh a, they've done the, the way they structured the, the Kickstarter too, is they have multiple levels. So you have like the, the lower end of things. Like if you want to just get the entry level stuff, you're going to get a bunch of taverns and, and a bunch of minis, but they have the higher levels. So the more, the you know, the higher levels have more taverns and more minis, more encounters available to you. We haven't really touched at all yet on the uh, the local legends part of this, which we'll, uh, we'll go into probably more when we start talking about the minis. But 
the, yeah, kind of about half of the set is the tavern itself and all the NPCs and all the interactions. There's a little, a few like little smaller side questy things around it. But then, yeah, where the minis come into it is that is every one of these taverns has its associated local legend. Oh my goodness, which, that's going to be so amazing. Mm -hmm. Which one they've done? Uh, I've no, I noticed that Steamforge did this with the Epic Encounter sets, and I like that they've continued it with this. Is each of them has guidance for how to scale the encounter up? Too. So like it's this one. So like for example, the the encounter that comes with this with the Nodding Dragon is a challenge three encounter. So definitely a a lower level type of thing. But it's like if you want to run this for uh, for a difference, here's how you can tweak this encounter so it will be more challenging for a higher level party. Which I love when because I, I remember back in the, back in the day is always the this module is for level five to seven characters. This module is for level two. It's like but that's cool. <laughs> I like this module, mm -hmm. but my party's like level twelve. And mm -hmm. now it's going to be a lot of work for me. So the, the, if they can do a little bit of that legwork, to at least give some guidance on here's some good ways to do it for, for different level ranges. I love that. It's like, I want to do your yeah, thing. Scale. Don't gate it to a specific level. Like, hey, scale is it. very important when it comes to that. Because, yeah, you want to be, I mean, you know, and, uh, you know, honestly, you can decide if something if something is that simple. Like maybe your characters do wander in and the tavern has a staff that basically tries mm -hmm. to run a con on the mall. And they're used to encountering people who are much less experienced. And sure, your characters steamroll over it, but it's a lot more fun to, to kind of level that out and make those checks a little bit more difficult and a little bit more real as appropriate to your party. So, yeah. Yeah, because now I'm thinking about the goose. <laughs> and I'm just like, the goose could leave Avernus. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> oh, well, it did leave Avernus with the Wiggy campaign. So now Goose is literally on the loose. I mean, that, okay. That's it. No, you, you, like, we that's... thought we thought the Tarask was bad. No, no, it's yeah. I mean, yeah. It's just a goose. How how bad can it be? A Godzilla-sized goose? Is it really? I mean, it seems like that goose has gotten bigger than since when I fought it. It has. <laughs> <laughs> It was. It I was, was like, large. I, I don't remember it being kaiju sized. I remember it being like, you know, banquet hall chandelier brushing size. You know, like it was big. <laughs> it's, it's well, you, That's it. Well, you know, when people decide when they plot out their idea of seducing the goose on Twitter, <laughs> and the DM can see it, you get what you get. Which is why they got assaulted by a horde of abyssal chickens. Seduce the goose. Got no. Hashtag in front of it. no, they did <laughs> hashtag it. That's the terrifying part. Heck yeah. <gasps> oh, wow. Yes, yeah, so I was like, I got you. I can see this shenaniganry afoot. Yeah. But imagine <laughs> the goose, not, not a kaiju sized goose, because that would be too much, but the pirate ship and a very large goose, a horse sized goose. Um, but I do see, I'm looking at the Kickstarter page now, and if you do exclamation point legends in chat, you can get a link to it. Um, they have a few, they have a few videos talking about it. They also have another video of, um, another tavern game, uh, Gollygon, and someone's done a video on that so you can get more information, but I love this. And the minis themselves, I have not, oh goodness, what's the word for really falling down this lovely rabbit hole of, uh, Help me out here, pirate. What's 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 an appropriate phrase for this uh, collecting? Oh, overwhelming. Uh, good. Uh, <laughs> mistake. Um, <laughs> hoarding. <laughs> hoarding is fine. Yes. It's you know. I mean, um, it's, it's it's a better alternative than taking a giant pile of your money and setting it on fire. Functionally, the end result's the same, but at least you get cool models out of it. It's true. It's, it's very true. Um, so that's where all my money went. Yeah. <laughs> Look, sometimes you look around and you're like, yeah, yeah, that, that's exactly where it did go. Absolutely. Uh, I just looked at my crafting desk. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. Um, and I'm seeing that the set comes with 38 minis. So, you know, make more room. <laughs> so oh, the, minis, the minis are going to start to need paying rent. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. uh, do you want to do one more game just to see if I can win because I'm competitive too? Absolutely. Let's let's do this. So we will shift ourselves ourselves back as Donovan grins at both of you. It's like, well, let's say just one more game. I'd hate. I mean, you, clearly, you've got the hang of it. That. That, my friends, is what we call a practice round. Now you have the hang of it. Let's try it for real. So, select your dice. Hmm. Oh, and uh, let's see. I think since last time we had uh, we had one of you start out with the attacker. Let's mix let's mix things up. If you so would start out as the attacker this time, you know, let's let's keep things a little e on an even keel. Fair enough. Hmm. It's a friendly so, game, remember? It's a friendly game. Uh huh, friendly. Oh, yes. Next time I oh, see yeah. you, you'll be around. I mean, honestly, well, it's, it's, it's to pay the tab, and we haven't even ordered anything yet, so let's be mm -hmm. honest. It's friendly mm -hmm. for now. For now. Oh, I can tell you all about the, the particular brews that this tavern offers once we're done. Please. But for, for now, let's pick your dice, and on the count of three, a one, a two, a three. Reveal your die. We have started out with the Caltrop. We have the four-sided and... Oh, we have indeed a, a double four-sided. Both selected the same dice. That would therefore be a point to our attacker. So we are one nil up. Switch the rolls. You are now on the... Let's see if we can continue this victory roll going as now you find yourself on the attack. Select just, your die. This feels like the most simple thing of all. Simply pick one of three, right? And do you go again with the same one? Do you change? What do you think your opponent's going to do? Are they going That's to do the same thing or not? This is why the game is called Smoke and Mirrors, all about deception. Mislead your opponent. And indeed, let's just get into our second round. The dice I see have been selected. So with a one, two... Three reveal the dice. We have, oh, going we have gone with, with the with same again. four sided again. And My camera refuses to, like, I'm sorry for your poor eyes. Something about the tavern oh, it's, atmosphere yeah. in here. It's very hazy. It's it's, it's, quite it's good. Right. It's good vibes. Takes, it's good takes vibes. Up his his, uh, shot, his uh, little like pince glasses. <laughs> and so, but I do see we once again both went with the four sided dice. Mm. So once again we have a point to the attacker. We have drawn even at one all. Hmm. Very interesting. Let us go to the second round. Of course, once again, the roles are switched. Our attacker and defender on the other foot. Select your dice. Will we continue? Will one of you continue a three in a row four sided selection, thinking your opponent would never choose that? Or are you both thinking this? Interesting. Let's see how this round plays out with a one, two, three. Reveal the dice. Ah. Have... <laughs> we have a very undeft hand. I've seen the sleight of hand attempt there. That is an eight-sided selection and a six. They are different. That will be a point to our defender. Well played. So now we are up to two to one. Interesting. A potential max point, a match point for our competitor who was defeated previously. Will we tie up these games? Or will we go to a sudden death round? Let's find out. Select your dice. We have the selections made, so let us see. Is this the end of the game with a one, two, three? Reveal. We are, oh, we're back to the four-sided again. Interesting, interesting. And that would be a, ooh, six. So that is indeed a point to the defender. We have tied at two all. Interesting. This is our final match point, with, of course, advantage being to our new defender. Hmm. This could be an interesting result. Select your dice for the final time. There's a great deal of thought going into these selections, I see, as is appropriate for the finale of such a titanic battle. <laughs> One, two, 
three reveal the dice. We have a six-sided and... Dang it. And a four that I dropped. I th that was a four. I did see the four. So that is a victory for the defender. Ha. I, so that, intriguingly, we have both of you tied. Which, of course, in this situation means the round is on me, my new friends. Congratulations <laughs> to both of you. Why, thank you, good sir. Mm. Allow me to offer the let me just switch back to the correct book here because i do want to because i love the descriptions that they've given for the the drinks in this tournament i wanted to to find a way to shoehorn those in so if you wish to take advantage of these taverns particular offerings there are two that are unique to this establishment which you might find most intriguing of course there is the famous dragon's belly brew drink of local legend it's a stout like drink strong as porthos's biceps though probably tastes a little bit better really agatha would know the rest of us we trust her judgment on that despite it's a bit of an acquired taste but we sell through a couple of barrels a day here at the Northern Dragon, and as a result, it's got the premium price attached to it, but it's very much worth it, I promise. The other is the rather intriguingly named Porthos's Back Hair. Another local homebrew to the Northern Dragon. It's a pale ale favored by halflings, uh, loved by all nonetheless. Uh, Porthos does not reveal the recipe. None of us knows what goes into it, but it it has been noted that a tankard of the back hair does have a slight aftertaste of oranges and fish. It's a little strange, but pleasant, I promise. Just an odd aftertaste, but, you know, it's probably good for you. That seems appropriate for a pale ale. Oh, my. I can only imagine the amount... I can only imagine the amount of hipster NPCs who come into this place insist insist on only ordering porthos's back hair oh and yeah, then absolutely. need to tell each other you know how complex and how how unique it is and people who don't order it are simply missing out and everybody else is happily drinking their other drinks like mm-hmm mm-hmm mm -hmm. <laughs> you're like enjoy mm. enjoy that because it won't be oh me oh my goodness oh my um, I like that there's a menu as well. That's yeah, like, they get the, the little bit of a menu. Anytime. What, what they've also done is they've got some nice plot hooks that I really like. And I'll, I'll tell you that there is a plot hook in here that I absolutely love, um, which I'll, I'll read this one because it is fantastic, which is every horse and other animal for that matter spending a night in the Northern Dragon stables gains the ability to talk. <laughs> None know how or why. But as, as immediately adorable as this sounds, it's causing a number of problems, not least of which is the animals keep blabbing their master's secrets everywhere. Mm. That is an amazing plot hook, and I love everything about it. Oh my god, I really hope Shreve did not hear that. Because can you imagine? <laughs> I, what I most love about that is they gain the ability to talk, but nobody said they gained the ability to understand speech. So you can't tell them to shush. <laughs> wow, you just took that to a whole other level. Because that's the best part of it. It's like, okay, well, yeah. Um... <laughs> oh my goodness. Now, admittedly, wow. you know, when an animal first learns to speak, it's not blabbing secrets. It's it's usually just, you know, commenting on random stuff. But I like that. Mm -hmm. Just like all of your all of your parties, all of your parties mounts having to like get them to shush, but not being able to like without, you know, without physical or magical means like, oof, love that. Mm -hmm. I just and especially like the, the mounts for one thing, but animal companions like imagine if Fenris were suddenly to gain the ability to speak. Oh, Lord. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I. You all would know all of Selyse's hidden thoughts. It would be bad. Because she, she talks to Fenris quite a bit. But she's not with the rest of you. Yeah, the, the revelation of what Selyse really thinks about the rest of the rivals. <laughs> that's, that, that's, that's an entire season right there on its own. Yeah, and what happened? <laughs> it's like, oh. Mm. 
<laughs> yeah, that then it'd be like, oh, I, you thought I was calling you an art because I was joking. See, that's the thing is you say that. I'm like, I don't think there'd be a whole lot of people that surprised. Wow. By that reveal. Salise is very, very, like, she is very forthcoming and very often hard on her sleeve. There is, there's not a lot of subterfuge when it comes to Salise. I gotta work on that. Damn. I was like, are you are you mad because I'm right or mad because <laughs> I have not seen you doing something? Because in, in that case, then there is a lot of subterfuge for Solis and I've missed it. <laughs> I mean, a little column A, a little column B, because y'all didn't know about her girlfriend. You didn't know about her girlfriend until she told you. Well, we, you and Kent well, we, did. Well, yeah, but it's not because, I mean, let's let's be honest. As, as much as we've gone about, we're all treat each other like adults. We don't follow each other around. Yeah, although some days I think we should maybe follow Shaka and Gosrick around. Just, we'll just tag, we'll just like, give everybody tagged, like just a magical radio clip somewhere on your clothing, it's fine. Wow. If, if you all follow each other around all the time, how are you ever going to get replaced by doppelgangers? Well, I mean, that does... See, that's it, you know. <laughs> yeah. We just go back to back and we just do the constant like circling as we walk through the streets and that way nobody <laughs> can be replaced by anybody else. You're right, you're right. <laughs> um now that we have uh swindled each other out of a round of drinks the next time we see each other uh how about you no talk? actually pirate what? the drinks are on the drinks are on that's pirate. it yeah pirate, next, pirate was the dm time. so yeah, the drinks are on pirate some, pack some plugs if we're, if we're all there again this year that's I'll it. see it's you a round before packs <laughs> well all three of us in the same place though true very true pack some plug door twitch god Although PAX that's Unplugged, true. That's true. TwitchCon is before PAX Unplugged. Um, but before before we collect on that from Pirate, Brian, where can people find you? What are you up to next? Uh, you can find me on the internet at Urban Bohemian. I say a lot of things. I tweet a lot of stuff. I stream a lot of things. And I cook a lot of things. Uh, this weekend, I am streaming. Um, I streamed this morning. Uh, I'm here with you now. And I'll be on tomorrow morning playing Animal Crossing. It is is no i'm sorry the fourth of july is monday but we're off for the fourth of july holiday so you will not see um either myself or tanya on rivals of Waterdeep tomorrow we are enjoying the holiday we're gonna enjoy some time off and we'll be back on july 10th and uh that's it you can find me at urban bohemian pretty much everywhere um i'm not gonna do an outro now because uh pirate and i are not leaving we're just gonna say goodbye nope. to brian <laughs> and uh we'll be back with some mini painting <laughs> Oh, my God. All right, we're going to take a quick BRB to switch out scenes and uh, back in a couple minutes. Thanks again, Brian. This was fun. We need to do this in person. Oh, thank you. All right. I would love the world to get itself together so we can do it in person, yes. That would be, that would be great. <laughs> All right, let's see, let's see if the stream deck betrays me like it did to you earlier. Oh, no. It didn't. Huzzah. Excellent.
Hello, we came back. We we sent Brian off to Hi. have snacks. Hello. <laughs> Look, you get both of us. Isn't it fun? It uh, is. All right, I'm gonna move, switch my headphones because I managed to tangle myself like I was Hello. yarn. <laughs> I don't know oh. how I did this. I, it's like when your headphones <laughs> tangle in your pocket and you have no idea how. Mm -hmm. I was gone for two minutes and they're they, now they tangled. Know. They know. All right. But uh, yeah, so whilst, whilst you untangle yourself, let's start talking minis. Yes. Yeah, we, we, uh, we, we focused a lot on kind of the role play and, and the mechanics, but uh, the, the local legend part of this is, is the part that really intrigued me with all the minis. Mm -hmm. And I, as I alluded to on Twitter, they, as I've, I've been a fan of Steamforce sculpts for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. They've really knocked out the park with this one. Yeah, um, since so, you have a top-down view, I will hold up the owlbear that is in front of yes. you. Here. So this is the owlbear. Um, and probably a little different because you have you have lighting right on you. Oh, and you've done some work on your Albert, it looks like. I have prepared mine. Yeah, we're going to chat about that a little bit as well. I did uh, I did do a little prep work for mine um, because of the painting technique I'm going to be using on it. Uh, oh. It required a little bit of prep work, but uh, I uh, I love it because I got the little like all the fancy details. Like it's a gorgeous it's a gorgeous sculpt. So did you fan. dry bush before you're starting your painting? Yes, I did. So oh. what I have done, so I, it's a technique I've really, I've really fallen in love with doing. Uh, which there's, a, it's, there's a couple of different ways you could refer to it. Underpainting is probably the most common one. Ah, okay. Uh, it's been, it's, it's a technique that's really kind of exploded in like the mini painting community recently uh, because uh, somebody by the name of The Honest Wargamer did a, a video about it which he dubbed it the slap chop technique, okay. um, which uh, really took off. Uh, but the whole point is it works very well to get your highlights as an initial step. And what I, I like to use the, I'm, I'm using Citadel's contrast paints. Uh, Army Paint also recently came out with their speed paint range. Okay. Um, the idea being that their paints, which are kind of a, they exist in kind of a mid range between a wash and a full and a regular acrylic paint. Mm -hmm. um, and they work really, really well with this type of, uh, this type of technique. Because uh, you get their, their, their opaque to the point that you keep the highlights as the paint goes on. Oh. So it essentially saves you the uh, the you can you can just kind of slap a contrast paint on it and call it a day if you're just doing stuff in tabletop quality, or it saves the because normally your base coat wash and then you have to kind of have that extra step where you need to build back up the base coat because the wash darkened it down so much. Yeah. This kind of cuts out that step. Oh, so, so you can go straight back to just doing your highlights. So. so um... You know, also, if you wanted to know way more than anyone, I just like painting minis for fun. You should go follow Pirate, because Pirate knows all the things. Also, <laughs> I, I know some of yes. Look, I didn't know what underpainting was. I've heard of it, and I'm too afraid to mess up the mini to even try it. Um, but in terms of the owlbear, a lot of times we, we don't see owlbears standing up like this for minis. Right. Um, I yeah, I love the the because it's especially too a lot of the the owl bears I've seen they're very, uh, I think hulking is the word I'm looking for. Very kind of wide, very stout, very kind like there's the the one that whiz kids do, which is a mini I love. That uh, but like you said, it's very hunched over on all fours. This it looks a lot more humanoid. Yeah, and I love that. Um, I'm also a huge fan of base detailing, and I love this tree stump that they've got. I know. I was looking. I was like, "Ooh, I did not get to this," but I know that this will be one that we we paint more of on the stream after today. But mm -hmm. um, in terms of running an adventure, do you have the mini handy with the Albert's nemesis? Ah, did you mean this one? Uh, yes, I believe that is our... Yes, our druid that also comes with the... Uh, th so these both are tied to the uh, the Nodding Dragon. 
uh, the, the encounter of the, the local legend. I'm not going to go into specifics about it for spoiler reasons. But yes, you also get this really... And let me kind of hold it super close up to the camera so you can see. Oh, you've done I the love same space. detailing. I've done the same thing on this one as well. So you can really see those cool face details. Nice. And I gotta say, I don't know what they've done, but they've really upped their game with their casting process for these minis, I've noted. Because let me um, just over here on my desk, for example. Um, I have like one of their Animal Adventurers minis. Mm -hmm. Which is still, like, these are great minis. I love them. But they're using a different type of resin, it seems, for all yeah. plastic for these ones. And it's really helped. Like, the details are super crisp. Yeah, because that one's really light gray, even before the detailing work you've done. <clears throat> and uh, I saw the question in, in chat from Stephen. Yes, so the underpainting is, it's related to Xenophil highlighting, but it's slightly different. So, and really you can kind of combine them. So what I've done with this one is I undercoated it pure black and I gave a heavy dark dry, uh, a dry brush of gray just to get the detailing picked out. What I also did afterwards is you can see kind of on camera how there's like the darker gray here and it's mm. much lighter on the top. I, that's where I kind of applied Xenophil Highland to it where I then went over again in a lighter gray and I only did that in directions where I wanted the light to be coming from, which is how Xenophil works. So there's, there's element, it's, it's different than Xenophil highlighting, but there's overlap between the two and you can apply the concept of Xenophil to this as well. Uh, okay, and Zero said, also no sketching and value pass, which I'm yeah, not Yeah, there's so a million different, like, like it, as, as with most things in mini painting, it was a technique from traditional art that artists, many artists stole and applied to movie painting. <laughs> There's so many different names for the technique, but it's just dark and then dry brush your highlights on is is all you really need to know. There's like 50 different names for the damn thing. But I think that's why, when I mentioned the, the slap chop dubbing of it, I think that's why it took off as it, it was one easy name okay. for this technique that had like 500 different names for it. It's like, that's why people gravitated to it. Um, but the, since you... the reason I really like it is it's quick. Oh, okay. Um, you can get, if you do that and the contrast paints, um, like if anyone follows the stuff I've been posting on Twitter of late, I've been really focusing on trying to up my speed. And mm -hmm. most of the minis I've been painting lately have been ones that I've knocked out in one setting. And it's because I've done this and just slapped contrast on. Uh, which actually, I may as well, I'll go ahead and get started so you can kind of see how this works. So what I've decided to do for, for my owl bear is I'm going to go with a very traditional brownish owl bear, um, mainly because I, that way I get to use one of my favorite paints in the entire world, which is uh, Citadel's Gore Grunter Fur Contrast. Ooh, I might uh, have to get that nice, one. It's a nice, like, it's a reddish brown, and it, I'll actually show you what it looks like. Because I used uh, but it. While, while you're doing that, since you brought a value, uh, mm -hmm. The highest tier on the Kickstarter is a hundred and thirty-one pounds sterling, so about a hundred eighty US. Mm -hmm. But you get literally everything. Yeah. Um. So because I'm a big nerd, um, I backed at a hundred and thirty-one pounds sterling. Um. Oh, I'm sorry, a hundred fifty-nine US. So you get you literally go. everything. You also get a set of exclusive dice, GM screen, digital tavern guide, and bard sung cards for all of your minis. So I know with getting back into, into painting, I've probably spent more than $150 just on paint and minis, let alone mm -hmm. everything else you're getting. Oh, yeah. They're, they're fantastic. I, I, I do a lot of Citadel's minis, which are extremely expensive but they're they're good quality uh like i do a lot of reapers like bowen's line which is the cheaper end but you don't get the the detail of the quality this is a great midpoint and yeah the the amount of because it was what 40 something minis i think you get with the the, the set uh, Several, for which some one? Of, for, uh of the the full the you full get set 
all 32, I'm sorry, 38 minis. 38 minis, that was where it was. And with that, I know there's a variety of like, some of them are the size of this uh, owl bear. There's, there's smaller ones in there. There's one they had in there that I, I really want to get and I'm really excited to paint, which was the, uh, I think it was like a fire gin. Yes. The Afriti, I that one looks amazing, and I really want to get my hands on that and ping in. That yeah, looks super fun. There, I'm I'm just scrolling through the Kickstarter. There's Elementals. Mm. There's a Griffin and Trap Messenger. There's of course a dragon because dragons. Yeah, but you got it. It's an Afriti and five Fire Elementals, and that is one of the Kickstarter exclusive ones. Mm-hmm. If you don't back this Kickstarter, you won't be able to get it. Yeah, and I will say, you, you kind of touched on that a little bit ago. One thing that I love that they did was that they made everything compatible with Bard's Son as well. Which, mm. I, I, I have to admit, I personally have not picked up Bard's Son um, because, honestly, because of the pandemic. It's it's what, like I own a copy of Gloomhaven, but I have never touched. Oh, wow. Uh, purely because I, it's one of those things that you need to get people in person to do it. Um, but I loved the concept of Bard Sung, and if, if you know, we were still easily able to just get together and hang out and have game nights, that's one I would absolutely have picked up. And so I love that they, they went and made it compatible with their other product as well. But that always makes me happy. So, okay, you took the opportunity to go through and, and apply that additional value for people who support your other products as well. Big fan of that. Big, big fan of that as, as, a, as an approach. Yeah, yeah, it's and we can kind of oh, sorry, God. No, I was saying it's just so interesting the way the different ways people use minis, don't use minis, because there's so many times where, like you said, during the pandemic, I've got all these minis. Have I used them in a game? Absolutely not. Will I use any of these in a game? I hope so. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I always think it's it's better to, uh, for me. The the painting and collecting is is a big part of the hobby for me. And honestly, what I have found is even for, for when I'm using, um, when I'm DMing virtually, I actually find that the minis are still super helpful for me. Mm-hmm. And it's because I, as I kind of touched on earlier, I struggle to visualize things. I can't put images in my head. So h- having the physical mini present actually really helps me as a DM because I can have it there and, and reference it and it helps keep like the image of the thing in my brain. And I, we're using Roll20 for my campaign currently, but what I have done prior to using that, before we really got the hang of that, for camp- even though my players couldn't really see it, when we did combat encounters, I was still setting up the minis just on my desk just okay. to help me run the encounter. So I had a visualization of, okay, this is what the space looks like. This is, because I think theater of the mind is fantastic and I love it, but there is a problem when the theater in my mind is in pitch black. Oh, so, interesting. So having the, having the minis even in a, a virtual sense definitely helps. And honestly, that's something I've really wanted to do Especially since I, you know, I, I showcased the uh, the Epic Encounters sets on my stream a little while ago. And because of the state of my desk, as you can see behind me, I haven't gotten around to do this yet. But I do want to, at some point, run through on stream some of those encounters using this camera so I can have the actual physical mini setup going. Oh, okay. Because I've seen a lot of people do that with, with like, Roll20. They have the, the, the fun, like stuff going in there and that's cool but i really like the idea especially with my focus on mini painting of finding a way to incorporate minis with virtual like live stream stuff as well i think that could be kind of interesting so i want to see and as this is going through so i'll pause here for a second you can kind of make out it's a little difficult to tell at this this stage but you can see how some of the the highlights are still showing through on this. Like oh, it's wow. not just a flat, a flat brown. Yeah, and it's is that like kind of is is and maybe just because it's a, on camera. Is this more 
Is it metallic? Because it seems almost metallic. No, I think that's just the shine from the light. Ah. Um, it's also because the paint's still wet. So, um, yeah, no, this, I will say this, the, the underpainting doesn't work well with metallics. Um, that's kind of a waste of time because they are strong enough as a pigment that it doesn't really show through. Mm. But, See, that's uh, interesting. You're dipping right in the paint, and I'm always too afraid to do that. So I w I'm doing that because it's a contrast paint. If I, were oh. to, if I were using standard acrylics, I would never do that. That If I were doing standard acrylics, I would be using the, the wet palette that's right here. But contrast oh. paints, you don't need to thin down because of the way they're formulated. Oh, huh. Um, I'm learning something new, too. And again, um, Citadel contrast to the ones I'm using. Uh, Army Painter also have a speed painter range. Um, Actually, Citadel next, uh, they're actually going up for pre-order this week. They're doing a whole uh, whole expansion of the contrast paint range that I'm really excited to pick up and play with. Oh, uh, see, this sounds dangerous. I already don't have, you will see the state of my desk when I am mini painting. Where uh, am I going to put all of this stuff? Yeah, that's, that's certainly my problem. Like I've got four, you can't, you can kind of see the edge of one of them right here. I've got four paint holders on this desk and it's not enough yeah if the 3d printer wasn't on that desk um it would be full of paint now mm -hmm. yeah i need to uh I, I what i need to do is look into getting one of those uh the rotating ones i've seen like a rolodex of paint it's like that sound wow but that would be a space saver for me for sure um and so also, yeah. oh go, go ahead, ahead. Oh, go ahead. I was just, so I'm also really enjoying This is my first time actually using this painting handle too. Um, it's the one I just got in from Redgrass Games and it is uh, Jester's fault. Uh, he is the one who, who recommended it. And yeah, he was right. It's really good. I've never used one that rotates before. It's fantastic. And uh, while you're chatting, I just realized I'm the worst. And uh, because I am the worst, I had not put my captions. Oh, no. Yeah, I somehow got it to be basically uh, a black background. Oh, inverted is what I did. Ah, uh, is it black on black? Uh, is black, is white text on black background? Uh but I've also got to move it because it's covering my name and I'm the worst. Um, but if you switch yours to inverted, that may yeah. help. Yeah, let me do that real quick. Um, and while me. Pirate's doing that, I'm wondering, because I feel like, like with these, it's great because A, not everyone yet uses minis or has the space or whatever, but with Rivals and with Black Dice, we don't, it's all theater of the mind. But I could see the supplemental stuff being good for someone that either prefers theater of the mind or just doesn't have room for minis or doesn't meet in person. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I, I just saw Stephen point out in chat that, yeah, they have a, a, that digital only tier. Mm -hmm. For that reason, that's super, super useful for, for because so many people now, they, again, I do minis because they make me happy. But so many people these days have they like they just DM virtually or play virtually, like which I I do love the rise of that and mm. like the tools that we have now for that is fantastic. So I like the approach of no, if you want just a digital only one, cool. Here's here's an option for you. Like even if you don't just want a physical book. Because I, I I'll be honest, I've really I haven't bought physical books in a while now. Really? Yeah, like, I love them, but I only have, I live in a New York City apartment. I only have so much space. <laughs> and yeah. um, given that I'm not DMing in person, it's so much more convenient for me to, especially in like a PDF, to be able to just control F for the part that I need at any particular moment in time, as opposed to having to like go through the index, scroll, and uh, like, through the pages to find out it's just so freaking helpful I, I love the books from a collector's standpoint 
but I don't find them as useful, especially with all the digital tools that we have available now. Yeah, but I'm in that weird position where I get sent the books. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but I'm running out of room, so you can't see behind me because my camera zooms in so quickly or so close. Mm -hmm. I thought when I bought bookshelves for this new apartment that I would have space and I could get more books. I have books that I can't put out. Oh, no. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm... I'm, don't get me wrong, I'm grateful. You know, companies like Steamforge and Wizards sends me stuff. Mm -hmm. But then I look up, I'm like, there's one of me. I don't need four copies of this book. <laughs> yeah, I can certainly understand that. <laughs> but again, that's where I love that the digital stuff is, is super, super helpful. Oh, it's great. Um, so if you have not yet back or whenever you just, whenever you back before Friday, are mm -hmm. you going to go for like everything going for digital? Cause I know you're more on the like painting and using the mini side than I am. Yeah. I'm going for the full thing because I want those minis. I want those minis so badly. Um, I'm in love. There's, there's one, I think it was the, the hag encounter. Mm-hmm which has some like willow wisps that come with it. And okay. I'm absolutely in love with those models. They are bizarrely cute. Oh. And I really, really want to paint them. <laughs> Cause that's always my thing is I, I tell myself constantly, I don't need, my backlog is enormous. I don't need to buy more minis. I don't need this. And then, and it's always Steamforged who do it. They put out something new. And I'm like, damn it. Oh my god, it's I, so cute. Right? Like when I, when they said they would when I saw Will O Wisps, I wasn't imagining like adorable little orbs. Oh, I put a link in the chat, but it was the whole thing. You'll have to oh. you'll have to zoom in or just go look at the Kickstarter. But yeah, it's the Adventurer's Rest. Mm -hmm. Why didn't we get those? They're so cute. I know, right? And the, so the, the the ghost pirate is fantastic. I'm obviously it's me. I'm going to immediately be drawn to anything piratical in nature. But yeah, the the hag and wisp come with the sixty six pound tier, which is interesting because for once, if Stephen backs this, he'll get it before we will. That's true. And yeah. that's that's one thing too in regards to think thinking about inspiration with a lot of these taverns, I've been thinking about, I want to see if people get inspired to actually build like physical representations of some of these. Oh, thinking I can, people... I can hear zero now. Zero was exactly where my mind was going. Like thinking of somebody who is incredibly talented at doing terrain builds. I, I would love to see people like create, even just like 3D print, printable, like, terrain based on some of these like, again I, I i keep that i'm going to keep banging on about that one tavern that's an upturned pirate ship <laughs> because i'm in love with that thing i want that as a terrain piece is that the salt and kraken i think that's a salt and kraken yes uh so from the from the kickstarter which you should go back built for the remains of an upturned galley and salt and kraken is a bustling ocean side tavern Offering strong booze and entertainment aplenty. The stockpile of more rum than most sailors could ever dream of. Brawls are a common occurrence, but the chef's famous fish chowder keeps the crowns rolling in regardless. Well, until the ghost pirate made himself known, that is. See, I want to go to that tavern. Like, you for would. real. I want that tavern. I want to go drink at that place. So for next birthday, we have to decorate a bar like this tavern is what you're saying? Yes, I would love this. So love who, who in the chat knows of a bar we could go to? Look, there's a pirate tiki bar here in New York, I'm just saying. Wait, there is? I have to check if they survived the pandemic. I don't know if they're still still open or not, but yeah. So field trip when I'm in town next month. <laughs> Absolutely. 
Uh, and Prax says there's a bar based out of an old ship that's in Maine. Ooh, okay, I love that. And Maine love isn't that. that far from you, I guess? Maine is not, Maine is, is reasonable distance. Huh. Oh, goodness, you know what we could do? Hmm. Make a vacation of it, buy out the bar for one night, when this is out, do the game that is set in the in that tavern. Oh my god, yes. Okay, I'm just like more amazed at your speed because it takes me 10 years to paint anything and you're almost done with this owlbear already. See, this is why I'm saying this technique with the contrast paints is so fast. It's wow. it's really it's great for getting stuff on a table quickly and that's why I've been focusing on it so much is I know a lot of people are put off from the idea of mini painting because they think it's difficult and extremely time consuming. And don't get me wrong, it can be. Like if you want to really kind of knuckle down and put like an, a massive like golden demon winning display piece, yeah, that's going to take you a really long time and just mm -hmm. take a lot of talent. But if if what you want as a DM is just to or maybe just like as a DM, it's like a war gamer. If you want to just get stuff onto a tabletop to use super quick, this is the way to do it. Okay. Because um, yeah, as you said, it's uh, I'm there's there's details to add on, but yeah, like I'm close to done. Um. So what color are you putting on the tail and the head? So uh, this was just a random bit of inspiration. I, this is another contrast paint. This is uh, snake bite leather. Okay. Um, but yeah, they're, they're actually about to come out with a bunch of different like colors, and I really, really want to play with them because there's some gorgeous looking browns in there. I the the one thing I I don't like about at least I have to check into see if it's just that I don't have the ones in the range, but. I do wish there was a, a wider variety of light browns because they have a lot of like darker browns, one of which mm -hmm. I'm going to use for this um, tree stump later on. But I find they're very dark to the point where even with the underpainting, you lose some of the highlights. Okay. Which is, is fine. Like it's it's useful still, and you can, but you need to, you really need that additional step of going back and highlighting them up again. Oh, wow. So that I think is looking. Oops, so then. For the for the base, what would you use? Because it's you've done that same technique there. Mm -hmm. So what I'm going to do for the base is, and this is kind of up to interpretation. The way I've interpreted the sculpting on this base is it mm -hmm. looks like mud to me. Okay. So I'm going to do a very very dark brown for that. Okay. And while um, you're doing the base, I'm going to get water for when we switch over to my my good. very naked owlbear. Goodness. My owlbear is naked compared to yours. It's all good. Uh, but you can really see with that with the snake white leather, with it being a much lighter brown, you could really see the benefit of the underpainting. Oh yeah, that looks dope. Like those highlights on that on those feathers, and it's it, the reason I did it too with this. So underpainting does not work as well for minis that have a lot of large flat areas. Um, but. A mini like this where it's got so much texture on it is absolutely perfect for it and it's like boom get it onto the tabletop done sorted yes all right uh keep chattering i'm going to go get some water and paper towels because like many times when i decide to paint a mini i've forgotten two very important things yeah i always forget to do that always forget um but yeah, and so, the, so whilst uh, once I'm done with this and once uh, once Cypher takes over doing the the Albert, I'm going to continue painting along with the Druid. It's going to work super well for him as well because he's got a lot of those uh, very very intricate details on, and that's something that I've noticed with with a lot of Steamforged sculpts. They're really good for that. They have a lot of those intricate detailings. Um, I don't know who all did each of the sculpts for them. I know. One of the sculptors who works for Steamforged is one of my absolute favorite sculptors in general. Is a guy named Russ Charles, who, if you are at all familiar with the Dungeons and Diversity range that Strata Miniatures put out, which if you're not, you should be, go check it out. Uh, he's the one who does a lot of the sculpts for them, the combat wheelchair range that Strata does. And those are some of my absolute favorite sculpts in the entire world. 
Uh, again, I don't know who sculpted what in this range, but wow, uh, Steamforged have really got some incredibly talented sculptors working for them. Huzzah, I have water. Huzzah! I'm actually very excited to see uh, what more stuff Steamforged do in future, because I noted um, that uh, it was announced that Gabe works for them now. Uh, yes, I'm excited and... Uh... You know, we are here enjoying this great discussion, but what's interesting is that uh, everyone is off having a Motherlands meeting while we're here painting minis. Oh. <laughs> well, hopefully that is uh, going well without you there to oversee. Oh, I'm sure they'll be fine. Uh -huh. <clears throat> and uh, there was a update for our backers. Well, there'll be an update, but if you're in the Discord, a new sample of the book is available. Excellent. I need to go and give that a read through then. <clears throat> I'm very excited for that. I'm excited for this book to be done. I don't doubt. I mean, it's, you've been working on this for a good while. And like, it's It's got to be exciting to get it ready for ready for launch. Yeah. Um, what's interesting, though, and you know, to bring it back to Steamforge, is that mm -hmm. I don't think people realize how much work goes into creating oh, a game. No. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Let alone, you know, kind of what you need to get a a book out in the world, and the amount of money, which is why I'm so glad the Kickstarter is doing phenomenally. They're almost mm -hmm. at two hundred thousand dollars. Wow. <laughs> uh, what was the, the goal? Um, the, the, the funding goal? So because it's in pounds sterling, it's a very odd number in USD. Mm -hmm. But the goal was $60,524. Wow. Um, but with the currency conversion, it's currently at one ninety five. Nice. And it was a $50,000 goal. So it's a little weird because it was mm -hmm. the goal was set in pounds sterling. Right. Which... I'm still not used to, even though I've been over to London and the UK, and I still go, what is, oh, my funny American money does not mean anything. <laughs> yeah, that, the conversion still throws me off constantly. So I'm going to bust out another contrast, Cygore Brown I'm going to use for the mud on the base. Again, this mm -hmm. is one where... It's super dark, so it's not going to show through quite as much of the underpainting. Yeah. But should be enough for a, uh, yeah. for a good, like, mud style. Right. And uh, whenever you're ready, I have, I have poured some paint. I've got water. Because I'm trying to decide if I'm going to do light gray, dark gray, and blue, or just kind of wing it. I did, I did really like that kind of light gray blue concept that you were talking about when we were chatting before the stream. Like that does sound really cool. Yeah. And, and I've got a, I've got like a gray, I've got a sepia wash that I think would go well. Ooh, nice. Or actually do a, a dry brush in a different shade of gray. Mm -hmm. Or even yeah, white. I, yeah, just last night I painted up three baby owl bears as kind of like a, a preparation thing to get myself in the in the headspace for this. Mm. My absolute favorite one is the one that I did gray. Like it looks, it's so cute. Yeah, I've got a snowy owl bear kit somewhere. Have I opened it? No. Do I know where it actually is right now? No. I know that feeling. Funny thing, when you organize your apartment and throw out a bunch of stuff, you find things you've been looking for. It's amazing how that works, isn't it? Yeah, Shocking. which is why my brain is like, why are you going to order more minis? You don't have room for the minis you have. But oh well, I already backed the Kickstarter too late now. Uh-huh. It took a phenomenal effort of willpower for me to not back a Reaper's Bone 6 Kickstarter. Because I backed the Bones 5, and I, my desk is still covered in stuff from that. And I got that in like two years ago. Wow. There were so many. Like, I still have the damn pirate ship from that sitting on top of my display cabinet over there. I still haven't painted. Wow, that's a lot. I need, 
it is it's so much and because the reaper set the bones are so affordable as far as minis go but uh, as a result you get a lot of stuff in that kickstar you got a lot of the stuff oh that's wild so i bought a bunch of the citadel paints and i <laughs> did not think about the fact that i probably should just dip my brush in them so i was sitting there going how do i pour these i'm going to get paint everywhere so that is the uh that's definitely the catch with them is the the biggest complaint people have about citadel's paints is the pots um like i love citadel's paints i think mm -hmm. they're formulated fantastic i love a lot of the calibrations in them they have they go on really well the pots are a freaking nightmare what i am actually going to at some point i'm going to spend um like a, a day i bought a bunch of empty dropper bottles Mm -hmm. And I'm going to go, my next plan is I need to go to like a dollar store and buy some of those really cheap, like, uh, cake icing funnel nozzle things. Okay. And I'm going to put, take all of the, the pots and put them into dropper bottles. Oh, okay. Um, but yeah, I, what I usually do when I'm using the regular acrylics is that's where my wet palette comes in. I'll, I'll take like a brush full out of the pot and transfer it to the wet palette and thin it down there. Huh. What I, what I really need to spend more time playing with, but I haven't gotten around to breaking them out yet, but I have sitting next to me on my desk right here is Turbo Dork. Oh, all the Turbo Dork. So much yeah. of it. Yeah, like you and Zero and Panda, I know, have, have sold me on it because I know all of you swear by their stuff. And I really, really want to get around to, to playing with that. I just need to find the right mini to do it with. Oh, I, we should talk after stream. Yes, uh, definitely. <laughs> uh, if you are done with ye old Albear, I think I'm going to switch over to start on my naked Al Albear. Do you still have stuff left? Oh, uh, you still have I'm the tree stump. I'm just finishing up the tree stump, but that is uh, that is pretty much it. Other than that, I need to do a little work on the eyes, but then, other than that, I'm gonna call our owl bear. Oh no, I missed the the pad, the paw pads. That's what I hadn't done because I was saving those for that darker breakfast bar. So let me just slap those on, and then it will in fact be done. Huzzah. So let me just do those real quick. So. Here, let me just get you around here because they're they're hidden away. So oop, oh, I almost missed those. I'm not gonna get super delicate with them. So I can always clean them up later if I need to. I do like that one of the little details I noticed about the owl there is that he's missing a claw. Oh. There's this little like and it's, uh, initially, I thought, like, oh, did the claw break off? It's like, no, no, they've got a hole carved in for it. That's that's by design. Oh, wow. We may have different owlbears, because I think my owlbear has all their claws, unless I've totally not seen it. Oh, maybe mine did break, and <laughs> it just happens to look like a, a really cool thing, because it, it, it broke. In that case, if it did break just during shipping, it's done it in such a way it looks like it was built that way. So I got we're, lucky, I guess. We're going to say it was meant to be that way. There you go. All right, I'm gonna call you there. All right, with those poor pads done, I'm gonna call the owl bear tabletop ready. That is, okay, so when are you going to start teaching classes on this? <laughs> no, seriously, um, cause I'm just like, I have like five things that are taking me like a month and they're nowhere near ready. And while, okay, I'm, yeah. while I'm running my mouth, I will totally switch over. At some point, I will I will start doing a a, a, a panel at a con on how to how to speed paint. Yes. Because, yeah, oh, I'm... that is fuzzy. I see. Um, and because I'm the worst, guess what I don't have on here? Is it captions? It is because um, your streamer thought about captions early this morning. Did not think about them previously, but you know what's great? I could just grab links and do this very quickly. Thank and, you, Pub Hub. Mm -hmm. And you all can see my very naked owlbear. They're naked. 
Nothing wrong with that. Oh. They live in the forest, they're about to be. Being naked is great. Oh. Can you do me a favor and talk? Absolutely. I'm going to talk very carefully because I'm going back and popping the eyes on my owl there right now. So I'm very, uh, very carefully you... focusing that I can happily babble along endlessly whilst I do so. Here we go. Let's get this. Oh my god, there. Stephen. There we go. Oh. What did there you. Mm, Stephen. What did Stephen do? Oh, Stephen. I'm so bad. Oh, forgot that. Well done, Stephen. Well done. Mm, I, 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 will give you, I will give you a dish. Be glad I like you. Voice mod isn't <laughs> running. Otherwise, I would absolutely give you a sound effect. Um, <laughs> all right. So I've got a totally Nicky owlbear, which I'm not holding up well for you all. So I'm actually going to do a different color palette um, yes. than Pirate. I'm going to do some blue and gray and i'm actually going to make the top of the owlbear uh blue and i'm actually going to look at, at the stream because my bifocal year old eyes are going to struggle with seeing this owlbear in dim light and look at the camera so pay no attention to me struggling to paint this owlbear while uh, Pirate uh, talks more about the Kickstarter. Yeah, let me uh, go back and pull up the Kickstarter page myself over here so I can actually... Uh, and then you can back the Kickstarter when we're done with the stream. Absolutely, because that is 100% happening. Uh, so, so yeah, I want to just pull through. And actually, what I will also do, because I have up here on a very convenient tablet right next to me is I got the various uh, rule books. So oh. I can dig through some of the other other stuff. So as so, let me actually pull back up the. Do, 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 I forgot the my dropper on the other table. Item. So good job, me. Mm -hmm. To thin out this very thick acrylic paint. So, I do have a bunch of turbo dorks, and they're all over on my desk that you all normally see when I am painting. But most of those are metallics and color shifts. So I went with a good old Arteza for our bear friend, our owl bear. Nice. Oh, hey, a, a wild panda has appeared. Hello, panda. So here, what we do whilst whilst you're working on the, the uh, on the the owl bear, I will regale everyone with the the legend of the owl bear, which oh. uh, we have because we have that in the in the rule book. So we mentioned that. So going back to the taverns, like the focal point of this, and again to. This is the type of stuff that you could do, regardless of whether you do the, the digital pledge or the, the physical, whichever one you want to do, you'll get this type of stuff as well. Um, the So the taverns, each of them have a bunch of different encounters that you could potentially have, a bunch of different plot hooks, the quests the various NPCs could give you. But the local legend is the owl there, which is written thusly. The locals call him either the owl bear, exaggerating the definite article so you can't avoid the gravity being applied to the name, or just that feathery bastard. He, he's hunted around these parts for as long as the modern dragon has served beer, quite the span of years by this point. Of course, as the name suggests, he's no ordinary owl bear. He might look just like one more predatory hybrid of nightbird features and ursine brawn, but he's far too cunning for that. Far too wary, far too alert, and far too ruthless. Owl bears usually run away from hunters, or at least run away if it seems they're outnumbered. But this one, this creature hunts the hunters. It digs traps, its claws excavating rock and soil with ease, and then leaves trails of carefully plucked feathers to lure its victims in. There are even tales of the creature using magic, magic, though most dismiss such claims as ludicrous. Either way, the owl bear is a dangerous creature. More than a few people go missing each year, their remains found chewed and spat out a few weeks later. And the unfortunates aren't hunters. Usually they're scholars researching elementals or druidic magic, until of course their houses are broken into and their carcasses carried off by a creature far smarter than it has any right to be. What interest does an owlbear possess in such esoteric subjects? As to regulars of Nodding Dragon long opined, there is something wrong about that beast. 
So the creature passed into legend, spoken of with fearful respect and a constant challenge to those who believe themselves hunters or who would protect the lives of majors, academics and others with a passion for knowledge of the magic of nature. For the owl bear surely protects something of great value. So there is your plot hook for the owl bear, which is a whole bunch of stuff about it. Is this special features that the owl bear's lair has for DMs? And again, one thing I love as a DM is they've given you a combat plan for the owl bear. Oh, really? It's like okay, when the characters arrive, here is how the owl bear is going to react. It's like here is what they will do as the party goes through. If there are these particular classes in the party, it's going to react this way. Here's how it reacts as it gets more damaged. I love that, that type of thing. It's like, okay, if you're a newbie DM who is new to running combat encounters, that stuff is fantastic. Again, obviously if you're experienced, you want to do something different, cool, throw it all out. But yeah, I, I really think this, this set especially shines for people who are nervous about the Zero. Nice. Well done, Zero. Oh, Zero. I think this is a stream where you get the... <laughs> ah, I dropped my stuff. Oh, no. Not to my the equipment off the desk again. Hold on. <laughs> Good job. What were you going to say? There we go. That's good. I'm fine. Everything's good. I was saying, this is the, the stream where you get the polar opposite of, of pun reception. Yeah. <laughs> but Zero forgets I have his address and his actual legal name. Yeah, I do as well, actually, for that matter. Oh, really? Yes, I do. Hey, Zero. <laughs> Don't don't give shifty eyes. You know what you did. <laughs> uh, so let's say if we were going to uh, punish the punter zero mm -hmm. in this case with an owl bear from this. Ooh, yes. If zero, let's say, try to do persuasion on yield owl bear. Mm -hmm. What what the what do you think versus what's in there so we don't spoil it? What mm -hmm. do you think the Albear would do to someone like Zero? Ooh, now that is interesting. Now, given that the the rumors, if the local rumors are to be believed, that this particular uh, this particular Albear has a uh, the ability to practice magic, uh, I think a zone of silence. Would very much be where the owl bear went in response to that. It's like, oh, you're you're going to pun now. You can't speak at all. Ooh, that's interesting. Then, of course, you know that that then the the teeth and claws and other stuff comes in after that point. So yeah. basically, nobody could hear Zero scream. Exactly. Ah. Oh. <laughs> hmm. In the owl bear's lair. No one can. Screen. See, now I want to entirely, entirely, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you showed up, Zero, you knew what the deal was. <laughs> so I'm going to do something I normally don't do. I'm going to mix paint <sighs> for a different shade of blue, since I don't have, like, a sky-ish blue handy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You played yourself, Zero. You played yourself. Yes. Now, let's see if I can do this and have enough to paint the Owlbear. Because, as we know... Ooh, that is far too... I mm, That was going to be something real dirty, but you know what? There's no better <laughs> way to say it. It was going to be a really mixed tip on that. Ah, yeah, no, that's... I mean, I, I wind up, I, I need to be, get far better at caring for mine because I always wind up with the problem of having a split tip and that's just a very unpleasant situation. That just sounds like you need medical help at that point. Yeah, that's, I mean, it's, it's certainly been said. 
right, so there we go. I think I've got the owl, so I've dotted in the eyes on my owl there, so I'm going to pop them off to the side, and whilst you are working on yours, I'm going to start doing a little bit of work on our druid friend over here, I think. Ooh, so. fun. And you know, I know you didn't mean it this way, but it sounded like you're basically going to pop the eyes out <laughs> of the owl bear. Oh my god! If I could, if Minis had the ability to pop the eyes out, my life would be so much easier. All of us. All I of would us. love that. Like, please let me paint the eyes completely separately and just rotate them so they don't look wonky. Oh yes, please. Every miniature artist would love this. <laughs> so this is my attempt at at different shades of blue on the owl bear. Mm -hmm. Oh, I like now, that blue. So it's a little bit of cobalt. I'm sorry, a little bit of cobalt and a little bit of white. So I did like one squeeze of the tube of each and then mixed it with the tip of the of the paintbrush. Ooh, nice. And I'm sure if I if I had thought about it, I probably could find a sky blue. Mm -hmm. But I kind of like how this is coming out. Yeah, it's looking nice. So I will say there's a, a tip for people for, for mini painting. Um, if you are looking to, when you're, when you're mixing paints, if you're looking to make a lighter shade of something, don't mix it with white. Oh. Because you might think, oh, well, if you want it to be lighter, mix white in it. That would make sense. The problem with that is if you mix it with white, what you actually wind up doing is washing out the color. You're desaturating it. So a, be a far better way is to find like a lighter shade that's in the same kind of color gradient uh like a really light browns are often useful depending on what type of color you're going with or like if you're if you're trying to lighten the red mix it with maybe like a pink or a lighter shade of red but that's oh, uh that's, that's your your pro painting tip is try to avoid using white for lightning because it will uh it'll it just desaturate it rather than just giving you a, a lighter shade of because usually you're just trying to make it either more slightly more or less of the base color so. well these are two so would that apply to what i'm doing because this is a whole different shade of blue so i think you're fine because you're using different blues so it's, it's if you're trying to get light because that's more correct like you're not just mixing white into your base tone you're using a mm. lighter blue which is more ideal okay it's just a thing to think about because you'll you'll just yeah. I said if you mix too much white in, you'll just wind up with a desaturated mini. Yeah, and at that point, you might as well just pick up a different color. Mm hmm Um, because what's interesting, what I learned painting um, the the Soledad mini mm -hmm. is with all all those wings is that a there's an opportunity to play around with color. Yep and not make them just, oh, they're all white wings or they're all black wings. Is kind of figuring out what you want to do. And granted, I I am bad with color mixing, I think, I, in terms of, I look at a mini and go, oh, this would look dope in X color. Mm -hmm. I'm not great with that. And I really struggle with it, I think. I honestly do as well. Like, I'm good at once I know what a color is going to be, I'm good at mixing it. Like, I, I know which colors play well together, but deciding on an overall theme, I honestly really struggle with that too. That's one of the reasons, like, we've talked about this um, several times now, how I really enjoy when uh, people put out, like, painting guides. Yes. It's like, here are the colors that we use. Like, good. If nothing else, using those as inspiration is fantastic. Like, yeah, because I have all the crit roll minis that are unpainted. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, guess I got to spend an hour in Google. So one thing I will suggest with the crit roll minis um, specifically. So Reaper have a, a, a tool up on their site now that I absolutely love, which is you can upload an image and it will match it to their paint range. Oh. So especially now that we have... Um, say like the legend of vox machina come out which has that nice clean artwork in it 
that would work really well with that. So you could take a, like an image of, I don't know, like Vax and throw it into like Reaper's tool and it'll match. It, it does fall apart the more complicated an image gets. But I think with something like the clean animation style they used for Legends of Vox Machina, that would probably work with that tool really well. Okay. So like that was, I've tried that out a few times now and I absolutely love that tool. Like it's amazing. And two, once so, and if you do that, I can then there's a, uh, a a website I use I can send you off later, which the whole thing is it matches various paint ranges. So it's like okay, you know it's this this one in Reaper's range. So here's what this color approximates to in like Citadel or Army Paint or Viejo or whichever one you want. Nice. So. Um, now, would you recommend something like that for these minis? Because the one thing I really like, and it's the mm -hmm. reason I haven't thrown any of my boxes out is that a lot of these minis have a full color image of a final piece on the back mm -hmm. of it. It would be worth trying. I think the, the more complex a mini is, the more that tool is probably going to fall apart. But mm. I mean, if nothing else, you could like take a picture, like zoom in super close to just get like the one color you want and that would probably work better. Yeah. As it's, it's, there's a limit to what the tool is able to do. No, but, that, uh, I, that makes sense. I think that, I think that would. I think if you were to do like a, uh, just a segment of it and upload it in, it would probably work pretty well. Yeah, because I've, because you know, like I'm thinking ahead to these minis once they get here, mm -hmm. and it's just like, um, well, now I've got 38 minis. Yeah. <laughs> um. Well, but I've got the um some of the other epic encounter stuff they sent me and what i like is that there is a image on the back of the box that shows it fully painted fully done up yep because again i struggle with i'm not an artist i never took color theory so yeah me either what i've uh, learned i like to do as well is certainly in cases like this it's it's a little harder to come by but uh, I like to find various like, artists I, who I follow on YouTube who do a lot of really cool painting tutorials mm -hmm. and find something they've done that is close to the thing I'm painting. Mm. And that will, that will often work out pretty well. Like I'll say one of the, uh, one of the, the artists who I, I follow on, on YouTube who I find the most accessible for that is uh, Dana Howell. She does phenomenal... Um, like tutorials so like she's she's actually the one who I, that who i read i saw a video on her about uh the underpainting thing she's actually how i first learned about it oh nice and her stuff is super cool and i like her uh her approach to it i find really accessible um okay. very focused on warhammer stuff but there's a there's enough variety in there where like the base techniques can be can be uh useful and I said that you can maybe find something if you're that's similar enough. Like to use, like for example, um, the the mini that you've been painting, the big like winged one, has a massive amount of thematic similarities to uh, Games Workshop Sisters of Battle. Okay. So a lot of the stuff like that has been done with there, you can probably take that and apply a lot of it there. So that that type of stuff I like to look for is okay. What's fairly similar? and hmm. apply even if i don't find a, a tutorial for the specific thing i'm doing i can probably find something that's in the same wheelhouse and, and just kind of go with that um i accidentally a yeti owlbear i think hey i'm that's looking good honestly i dig it i dig um, it and uh quick time check shows that we I mean, I'm fine to go a little bit longer, but we are at the end of our sponsored segment oh, of this yes. stream. So, I can go a bit longer. so yeah, I want to get a little bit more done on on yield Albert because now I'm dangerous because now I have an idea. Uh huh. And I'm like, the <laughs> son of a. Oh, I'm sorry, but I'm dangerous because I have an idea. Maybe one of the most relatable things I've ever heard you say, and you've said a lot of relatable <laughs> shit. <laughs> and this is why we're friends. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Oh, that that hit that hit me. That did. Yeah. Oh, there was something that came up in uh, it was either your chat, my, it was a chat I was in and or moderating where someone uh, brought up 
um, beauty hiding things. And I know I took a screenshot and Zero grabbed it because I'm like, that should be a t-shirt. Oh, yeah, this sounds familiar. I don't think it was mine. I, I think I may have been in the same stream. I, I forget. The... Um, it was either mine uh, or Zero's. Yeah. But I, it yeah. was just because we were talking about current events. Yeah. And uh, I'm going to start in with the grays. Although I feel, so when a mini is primed in gray, I always feel a little weird using gray. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which, yeah, that that's sense. the cool gray. This is the just gray. Because it's primed in gray. And my brain goes, but, but more. Yeah, so that's actually one thing that I, I always like, try to advise people to when it comes to, to painting is it's always good to if you're if you're going to be priming something and you're going to be doing the same like color it's still good to repaint those areas like if you've primed something in black still go through and paint the black areas black because primer is formulated differently mm -hmm. so if you need to go back and fix something where you've kind of splodged into the wrong area it's not going to match so taking that additional time to go through and paint the areas that color is always always helpful so even if it's like primed in gray using the additional grays is always a good way to go i think yeah and now that i've got it on the mini this is very much a different shade of gray yeah um and also before i forget uh thanks again to steamforge for having us for letting us preview these minis and have fun with them for Brian for hanging out with us earlier in the stream and doing the tavern game, uh, and Pirate for being an amazing DM, because that was great. Oh, that, was, that was genuinely my first time ever DMing on stream. Really? So Yeah, first time ever. So thank you to, uh, th I, I could not ask for, for better people to pop that DM cherry with you and Brian. So, uh, so you're going to DM more, right? Oh, I would love to. It's, it's one of those cases of, I have I have all the ideas and none of the time. Yo, that's a mood. <laughs> yep, yep, that is the problem. But yes, I have I have all the all the ideas for things I want to DM. Just I I need time to do. Them. But yeah, I very much want to do more. I want to go back to our Dragon Age campaign. Yes, um... I I want you to go back to that. That was a, that was fun. I want you to go back now that I've actually played the damn game. <laughs> I actually Wait, know you, what's going on in that now. Had you not played Dragon Age when we were doing that campaign? I, I touched a little bit of Origins and that was it. Oh, wow. All right. Bye, Catherine. Thanks for hanging out. I appreciate it. Um, well, fun fact, the opera geek, Kelly, still has not played any of the Dragon Age games, but was on that show with us. Oh, wow. I had no idea she had never played. Oh, no. She had no idea. And then when I was like, you're gonna argue with Fenris? Are you sure about that? And she's like, uh -huh. "Oh no." <laughs> uh, yes, I mean, I honestly, though, knowing Kelly, I think even if she had played the game, she would still argue with Fenris. Yeah. Well, yeah. my Thursdays are spoken for until the end of the year because of Black Dice. Mm -hmm. Um, Wednesdays hopefully will be spoken for again soon, for reasons we can hope and pray and i will get an email soon um i'll bear but and i realized i'm leaning away from this camera i'm used to the other one where i have all that space oh yeah 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 um so i'm trying to at least get the the swath of owl bear butt which sounds a uh, that sounds really strange to say <laughs> out loud I'm yeah, trying to get the majority of the owlbear butt. That's mini painting for you. It is, uh, it's saying a lot of weird stuff. Yeah, that's why the, what I'm current, the, the project, the, the side project I'm currently working on um, with my friend Hearthstinger Games, uh, which we're, we're doing a, a, a live play, but we're doing it as a podcast. Mm -hmm. And that's so much easier. It's like, okay, we, we, it's been a nightmare to get off the ground, but we're finally kind of progressing on it. So, okay, I, I kind of dig that. I like the idea of, okay, if we need to just move things around, we can just move things around. Yeah, that that's, that's the hard part when it is a live stream and you're on a schedule. And especially like in the yeah. case of, you know, like Black Dice or Rivals, 
if the if the show's not on, the show's not on. Right. Um, and, you know, like, Dave wasn't feeling well this week, thus no Black Dice Society. You can't mm-hmm. really be on without... <laughs> Without the DM. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that's certainly a problem. Hey, Lee, how are you? Um, I'm curious to see how next episode's going to go down. Um, mm-hmm. Are you caught up? Not at all. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but uh, as I said, feel feel free. Like it's uh, I'm not. So ever since I saw the stuff that, that Mark had posted regarding Brother Your Right, it's like, okay, I've had all the spoilers in the world, so I'm not super worried about spoilers for that one. Ooh, are you working, or is this practice or fun? Uh, for those who don't know, if you've seen awesome pancakes online of characters, those are usually Goldberg. Mm-hmm. Uh, Goldberg was Pancakes337 and is now Goldberg. Um... Damn you. Not you, Lee, the napkin. Because it moved from the fan the second I put it down. Oh, yeah, I, ha- I have that problem. There's a reason that my... Uh, well, you can't see it anymore because it's, it's not, not focused on that camera, but my little bit of kitchen towel I always use for this is always weighted down under my wet power for exactly that reason. I can't leave it loose. It will go flying. Yeah, if you've got a link to the charity game, Lee, uh, pass it to a mod. Although I should, I should make you a VIP. You've been in my apartment. You saved me from a leg cramp. There's a story there, and I can tell it if Lee is okay <laughs> with that. Listen, if people saving you from a leg cramp. If that doesn't get you VIP status, I don't know what <laughs> does. Whereas I've had those. Those are nasty. Like, yeah, that's that'll get you right up there. So Lee was visiting Chicago, and we met up. Because I hadn't seen him since, what, TwitchCon 2019. Um, and we hung out. We, 